You know, one of my earliest memories is an image of lights reflected in a Christmas tree ornament. My parents would later tell me that looking at those reflections kept me occupied for most of the holiday season. You know, I can't tell you what was so fascinating about them, but they sparked an interest in me that ultimately led me to design and build optical instruments to better understand our Earth's upper atmosphere. So tonight, I'd like to tell you a little about a satellite that's carrying one of those instruments. But before I do that, I'd like to provide a little background on how I got to this point. I had an interest in math and science in grade school and high school, but I was really what would be considered more of a music kid. And I bring that up because I later discovered that the process of learning to play a musical instrument, in my case, the piano, has a lot in common with the process of acquiring the mathematical skills required to be a physicist. Both of these things require you to develop skill through practice in very small steps over a long period of time. But if you stick with the practice and continue to make progress, you can eventually get to the point where you can use those skills in creative ways to create something of value. Now, I went to college and studied music and physics. But I went to graduate school in physics. At a time when imaging sensors, the kind that we carry around on our phones every day these days, were becoming more common. And my research mentor and I realized that combining one of these imaging sensors with a rather unconventional arrangement of optical elements could lead to an instrument that was very small, very rugged, and very sensitive, particularly when studying light from diffuse gases like the atmospheres of planets. This photo shows the critical optical element that's at the heart of one of those instruments. The dime in the photo gives you a sense for the scale. Now, in addition to its technical merits, the fact that it's small, very rugged, and very sensitive, I think it has an aesthetic beauty. In fact, if you hang that on a Christmas tree, it might amuse a little kid for a while. <laughs> the most recent instrument we built was launched about two years ago on the NASA-sponsored satellite ICON. Now, ICON is dedicated to getting a better understanding of space weather, primarily by making measurements of the Earth's air glow. Now, space weather, which is the weather at the outermost layers of our Earth's atmosphere, affects many of the technologies that we depend upon every day, things like satellite communications, GPS signals, and even power grids. And as a result, there's been an interest from around the world in getting a better understanding of the physics of space weather with an eye towards improving forecasting of space weather events so we can better predict space weather storms. Now, air glow, the light that ICON measures, is perhaps best illustrated with this video taken from the International Space Station. In the background, you can see stars rising. At the bottom are lights from civilization, and you can see an occasional flash of lightning. But in between, at altitudes between about 50 and 200 miles above the surface, you can see a diffuse glow, red at the higher altitudes, a narrow band of green and yellow below. This is air glow. The air glow is, come, is emitted by oxygen atoms and molecules at these altitudes. Note that it's not the more familiar northern and southern lights, in that air glow is distributed over the whole globe, not just near the poles, and it's nearly almost always present. What's not obvious from the video is those oxygen atoms are moving, sometimes with speeds of up to 500 miles an hour. And the direction of that motion can change rapidly with altitude and time. This motion, upper atmospheric winds, are an important aspect of space weather that we know is driven by energy from the sun and energy coming up from the lower atmosphere, but the details aren't very well understood. And so ICON observes this air glow from an altitude above the layers looking at the edge of the Earth, much like the perspective in the video. And when the moving oxygen atoms emit light, it turns out the wavelength of, the of that light shifts by a little bit. And the shift is related to the speed of the atoms. This is called the Doppler shift. It's a general property of waves that's used, for example, in radar guns to determine the speed of fastballs at the baseball game, and by law enforcement to, to, to determine the speed of your vehicle. 
Well, to be useful for space weather studies, it turns out we have to measure the wavelength of the air glow with very high precision, better than one part in 100 million. Now, that sort of precision is challenging, but it can be accomplished with the help of our little piece of glass. The technical term for this piece of glass is an interferometer. It's a fancy word, but it's based on the interference of light. And so light comes in one side, is split and goes through two paths, comes back to the middle, recombines, and comes out. And the wavelength of that light is compared against critical dimensions within the glass parts, such that when the wavelength of the light changes, the brightness of the light coming out of the interferometer changes. So in essence, the function of this device is to convert wavelength changes, which are very difficult to measure, into brightness changes, which are much easier to measure with our imaging sensors. Now, the wavelength of light is very short. It's about 1 one hundredth the diameter of a human hair. And it must be measured very precisely. In fact, that leads to this optical device needing to be fabricated to extremely high tolerances because the wavelength is compared against critical dimensions within the glass. In fact, some of the dimensions in this piece of glass have to be matched to 10 one millionths of an inch. Now, I can design this device. I can tell you the pieces. I can tell you the shapes and the sizes. I can tell you the materials. I can tell you well, how well those pieces need to be made and assembled. But I have no hope of making this thing. In fact, I don't know of any scientist or engineer that can make this. So instead, we turn to craftspeople, artists, really, who have the required skills, patience, and attention to detail to do so. This photo shows Vass Zastera. He's the fellow that polishes the glass and assembles the pieces of the interferometers to such incredible tolerances. He's from a family of artists, originally from the Czech Republic, now living in Canada. His day gig is fabricating precision optics, but he's also a glass artist himself. In fact, here you see him working at his workbench, along with two photographs of his glass art pieces from his gallery. Now, it's interesting to me that the success of a highly technical mission like ICON depends upon people like Bass, who are neither scientists nor engineers. Now, ICON began in 2010 when NASA invited proposals for a satellite to study the Earth's upper atmosphere. In response, I joined a team of 20 scientists uh, led by colleagues at the University of California, Berkeley, to propose the ICON mission, consisting of four scientific instruments, one of which would measure winds. After a three-year proposal process involving 33 competing teams, ICON was the one selected by NASA for launch. I spent the next six years helping to turn the concept of the wind instrument imagined in the proposal into a working instrument, working out the final designs for the optical parts, working with people like VAST to fabricate them, assembling them, aligning them, testing them, calibrating them, and ultimately qualifying the instrument for space. By this time, there were hundreds of people working on ICON. And all these efforts culminated on October 9th, 2019, almost exactly two years ago, when ICON and its rocket boosters were dropped over the Atlantic Ocean from the underbelly of this jet. The rockets fired, and ICON was off into orbit. Now, since launch, my role has transitioned into monitoring the wind data coming from ICON to ensure that we get the most science that we can from it. Now that it's on orbit, there are a number of calibrations and corrections that require attention. For example, the satellite temperature changes as it goes from daylight to darkness and back into daylight once every 96 minutes as it orbits the Earth. And those temperature changes lead to changes in the dimensions of the little glass parts, which need to be calibrated and corrected, or they would introduce errors in the winds that are five to 10 times larger than the winds we're trying to measure. The satellite velocity itself must be removed from the measurement because it, at 18,000 miles an hour, is about 1,000 times greater than the precision that we require. 
Well, after you apply all the corrections and calibrations, you can make maps of the upper atmospheric winds. This slide shows the upper atmospheric winds for one day. It turns out to be February 3rd, 2020. On the upper right, you see the moving dot, and that's the location of the wind measurement that ICON makes for the 15 orbits on that particular day. And the panels on the left show the winds. There are 15 of them, one for each orbit. The winds in those panels are indicated by color. Red to the east, blue to the west. And the darkness of the color gives you the strength of the wind. Darkest color is corresponding to about 300 miles an hour. And you can get a sense, looking at the red and the blue, of the complex structures in these winds. In fact, in some places, the winds go from dark red, 300 miles an hour to the east, to dark blue, 300 miles an hour to the west, in a very short altitude distance. 96 minutes later, when the satellite comes back to roughly the same pot, spot, the winds are significantly different. So this gives you a sense for the variability in the winds on an hourly basis. Now, ICON's been making these measurements for two years now. And so in addition to these hourly variations, we also see day-to-day -day variations in the winds and seasonal variations in the winds. And these measurements will help us improve model predictions of upper atmospheric dynamics. This will lead to better forecasting and mitigation of the vulnerabilities that our technologies have to the effects of space weather. Now, in the 1980s, when I first started thinking about these little pieces of glass, I had no idea it would ultimately be included in ICON. In fact, it took over 30 years of development with the help of many people, including students at St. Cloud State, before the technology was mature enough to be included in a satellite like ICON. Of course, none of that development nor the satellite itself would have been possible without the financial support of taxpayer dollars. And in that sense, everyone in this room and out in virtual land have contributed something to the effort. Let me close by saying that you never really know what might inspire a lifelong endeavor. It might be something as simple as the reflections in a Christmas tree ornament. Thank you.